Right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ofek. I'm a software developer at uh, Istra Research, like Roy before me. Uh, we're an algo trading company, and uh, we're nice guys. Come talk to us. Um, what I'll be presenting today is a very little known tool from the LLVM universe called OptViewer that uh, I really hope can add value to you immediately. Uh, in essence, it's a tool that allows you to stop guessing uh, what optimizations the compiler performed on your code and uh, what it tried to do and failed and to some extent why. Uh, I will start by presenting the raw OptViewer tool. I will then uh, present my own extensions of it, titled OptView2. Admittedly, it's a, a work in progress in early stages, but uh, I hope uh, it can add value as is. And I will take a large detour uh, during the presentation to discuss aliasing, which uh, Roy already discussed. How many, people's he um, how many people here haven't been to Roy's lecture in this hall? Okay, so... I might repeat the introduction briefly. Um, yeah, I think I will, because aliasing is important. OK, let's get to it. Um, I wish the compiler could tell me, um, Listen, man, I, I didn't inline that function because, well, I couldn't even consider it. I didn't have its definition available. I had only its declaration. Um, uh, you know, these loop boundaries that, uh, see, it seems very obvious to you that they remain fixed and should be evaluated only once. It's not that obvious to me. I keep reevaluating them uh, on every single iteration. Um, or, in general, I'm doing uh, tons of ridiculous memory accesses that uh, if you would have seen them, uh, you would freak out. You might want to look into this. There might be something you can do about it. To some extent, uh, the compilers have been able to tell us this information since forever. Uh, raw optimization data has been exposed in the Clang and GCC and conforming compilers via the RPAS uh, switch family. It dumps to STD out uh, optimization remarks of this form. This function was inlined into that function. Other compilers expose uh, similar but not identical uh, switches. Uh, and this is typical output. This is uh, a wall of text without structure, without any way to differentiate what goes where, uh, what's important, and what isn't. And uh, hopefully we can do better. Presentation does matter. Essentially, the work that I'm going to present to you is presentation work. Uh, I will, this work started off uh, in Clang, an LLVM context. It did uh, take some steps in other directions. More on that in uh, uh, some slides towards the end. Uh, the opt viewer work was done primarily by these two guys, Adam Nemeth from Apple uh, and Hal Finkel from Argonne National Laboratories. Uh, and here's what it does. First, you build your code with an additional compiler switch Calls F, it, it's called fsave optimization record. This causes YAML files containing raw but structured optimization reports to be saved alongside your uh, object files. Then you run a Python script that processes these uh, structured optimization remarks this is the term used in the, in the documentation, optimization remarks. It processes these into HTMLs. These are HTMLs of your source code used in the compilation, annotated 
with optimization remarks. Here's what I, the compiler, tried to do to this line. Here's where I failed, here's where I succeeded, here's some additional diagnostics data. Here's a snippet from such an HTML. This is source annotated. Uh, we will discuss uh, extensively and deeply uh, these orange optimization remarks, so let me just point out some stuff that I won't be discussing, uh, that I won't be going into. Uh, one is these numbers. These are hotness numbers. They come from PGO data, if they are available. If you can use a profile guided optimization, the compiler does have data, data available of uh, relative hotness of the lines, which one uh, uh, was spent, in which ones did we spend more time during the profile taking. It aims to help you sort out the important stuff from the non-important stuff. And the other stuff I will just mention are these lines. This is inlining context. Typically, uh, a function code is inlined into various other functions. In both screens, in spite of these, what does it say? Block zero, block, what's your text? Um, can we adjust the... Uh, the projector position? Uh, these are, uh, this is inline in context and these are just names of functions. These are names of, of functions that this code, this function was inlined into. When you inline uh, a function into other functions, it typically undergoes uh, different optimizations. Uh, uh, some might succeed or fail differently and for different reasons. And uh, this context data is saved and reported alongside the optimization remark. Uh, really, you can't see to the right? That's a new one. Okay. Okay, so this was uh, done in 2016 and presented at an LLVM developers meeting. Uh, it didn't went to noticed. Uh, there's been less than 2,000 views in this talk since. Uh, the repo, the, it is an open uh, GitHub repo. It is for the past three LLVM versions, it has been shift, shipped along with LLVM and this repo has gone pretty silent for the last three years. Um, and I can only speculate on why. Um, one thing you should know is that this is a lot of data. Uh, the generated HTMLs are typically uh, many hundreds of uh, megabytes. Um, when I try to run this on uh, my full uh, project, uh, which is 2,000 and something uh, files, around uh, 800,000 lines of code, uh, I break servers, I, I stop the runs when uh, it, uh, its memory consumption reaches uh, uh, 70 or 80 gigs. Uh, th this is heavy to the point of being unpleasant to work with. And uh, the result is mostly unactionable noise to me. This was designed with compiler writers in mind. So an extra step is needed to make this usable to us. Let's try and take uh, this extra step. OptView2 is a beginning of work. It's a fork by me of these Python scripts that uh, aim to target developers, not uh, compiler writers. I want to inspect optimizations from the developer's side not trying to improve how the compiler does them, but see what I as a software writer can do about it. Sorry. Sure. Um, was something bad in the description of the problems in the first slide that you show? Yeah, for example, here it was pretty understandable, no? The next one. Next, next. 
No, no, no. No. Uh, yes. Let, no, I will not be improving the text of the messages. Uh, I will filter out lots of noise. Uh, uh, let me just continue and uh, I'll, I'll show you. So some of the stuff that I'm doing is I collect only optimization failures. I don't care about any of the million optimizations that succeeded. Uh, I mostly don't care about system headers. I might, but more often than not, not I don't. Uh, there's a ton of, tons of duplicity due to um, repeated uh, optimization messages from a different inlining context. Mostly I can settle for one copy of these. There's lots of other stuff that I do. I, I was able in uh, the context of my own work to uh, reduce the message volume by two orders of magnitude. This is still somewhat noisy, but two orders of magnitude less noisy. Um, compiler authors care a lot about optimization passes. Uh, LLVM uh, optimization works in granularity of passes. Uh, I don't care about them. I don't care when I see a particular optimization succeeding or failing. I don't care in which pass uh, um, it was run. Um, the index table, it's, it's a huge table uh, of uh, all the optimizations that the compiler tried to perform and uh, I need to thank uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Ilan Ben Hagai, who isn't here today for his JavaScript wizardry, which uh, helped make this uh, huge unwielding table much, much more pleasant to work with. Uh, there's other stuff. There's other stuff going around. Um, what I will be demonstrating next uh, are outputs of uh, this version of OptView 2. Uh, but the essentials are the same as the official uh, opt viewer, which is part of the LLVM shift. Uh, I will demonstrate on uh, examples mostly randomly chosen from uh, OpenCV, which is a very popular uh, image processing library. This is uh, what uh, an index page looks like. Uh, I know it's hard to read, but uh, I won't be going into any details here. If you, everything is uh, clickable. If you click on stuff, you can go to the, to the actual uh, context. Right, let's look into three concrete examples. Uh, the first one is rather easy. I know it's hard to read. This is the text. This function will not be inlined into that function because its definition is unavailable. This is a macro which expands into some code which contains calls to this function. And this macro is uh, defined in uh, some header that uh, this source file includes, but uh, it calls into functions which are not defined in this header, which are accessible only in some other translation unit. So, uh, assuming I want to solve this, what might I do? Yeah, that's right. I, I, I'm, the quick and dirty fix that uh, I did in this co context was just move the function that I was interested in, along with some other peripheral macros and functions, into a header that is already included. Um, I don't, I, I'm not an OpenCV developer. I don't know if this is the right thing to do in this context, uh, but this is the plus plus operator of a sequence iterator. Like when you it iterate over a kajillion of pixels, this is what you use. Um, this might have noticeable impact. Uh, I should say that if you are building with LTO, you will be seeing much less of this optimization failure. Theoretically, if you're building with LTO, it doesn't matter 
where, uh, whether the function definition is visible at this translation unit or not. But somewhat surprisingly, uh, these do not reduce to zero. I still see them uh, less, but I do see them in LTO builds. Uh, I don't know why. Sure. What are LTO builds? Sorry, uh, LTO uh, is link time optimization. In the Microsoft universe, it's called LTCG, link time uh, code generation. Um, historically, part of the reason for C++ success, success was its ability uh, to compile translation units, that is to say CPP files separately, where computers were so small that you could only build uh, one source file at a time. And uh, later uh, optimizations were performed at the context of an individual translation unit. And yet, uh, and later Link uh, only did wiring between these compiled translation units to, uh, to produce an executable program. Uh, a lot of optimization opportunities are missed due to this architecture. Uh, an obvious example is a cross CPP file inlining. Nothing was in place to even consider such inlining. Uh, in, in modern languages, um, this is uh, no longer a limitation. The optimization is done on the whole uh, source as a unit. But in C++, by default, this is not the case. LTO or LTCG uh, are um, modern modifications to this compiling and linking separations, whereas compiling compiles to not to machine code, not to object, to object code, but to IR, something like Java bytecode, in a compiler intermediate internal representation. And the linker performs optimization uh, when seeing the whole picture. OK? Um, OK, enough with that. Sorry, question? Uh, but LTO does not inline uh, something. Can uh, it prove uh, uh, something, but it cannot uh, really uh, perform inline? Like, uh, Actually, I think it does. Um, Actually, now I have the tools to prove it does. Uh, I mean, I, I did, not on OpenCV, but I did uh, compare the outputs of LTO and non-LTO builds on a different project, on CPython. And I do see differences, at least for Clang. <laughs> I mean in inlining. Yes, uh, I don't have the proof underhand. And uh, no, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the, the reports are wrong. Uh, we, we can discuss this later. OK, this is a more important example. Uh, here's a silly looking loop uh, run over a tile hist array and add reddest batch to each one of its elements. And yet, the compiler emits a somewhat cryptic error message load of type whatever not eliminated because it is clobbered by store. Uh, this calls for some deciphering. When compiler backend authors discuss load, they mean a load from memory into registers. And a naive compilation of this loop would look something like this. Redis batch has an address in a memory load the contents of uh, this address into a register, load the contents of tile hist i to a register, add them together, and repeat this process however many uh, uh, hist size times. Now, if I were to look at this compilation, I would have said, why do you need to reload redist batch uh, all these times, it's the same variable. Load it once into a, a register and use this register to increment each one of the tile hist slots. Maybe the, the overlap of tile hist and the 
Um, it is called aliasing, yes. Uh, essentially, the compiler says, uh, ah, you silly human. Uh, what if Redist batch is in fact a reference to one of the tile hist elements? To accommodate such a case, I really, I, the compiler, really have to refetch Redist batch from memory every single iteration. This is called aliasing, uh, and it is a big deal. It, I, I was amazed to see how often this happens. And in cases where a human eye uh, might classify as ridiculous. In fact, on uh, my own code, I, I mean uh, the code at work, more than 70% of the optimization reports that I get uh, are exactly aliasing problems. Now, admittedly, it, it needs to be said that when I say load from memory, if you do this 10,000 times, it's not really from memory. It's typically from a cache, but first, that's still a performance Im impact, uh, especially in tight loops. Second, reloading from memory uh, prevents other optimizations down the line from taking place. Um, if you were at the previous uh, talk, you might have seen uh, one example where reloading each of individual element from memory, for example, prevents uh, vectorization. So, what can we do about it? Make it a constant. Sorry? Make it a constant. Uh, make what a constant? Ah, no, actually that won't help. Making, uh, let me repeat that. If I would make Redist batch a constant, that would mean that direct modification of Redist batch is prohibited. It does not mean that other variables aliasing Redist batch cannot be modified. For instance, tile hist 459. Uh, it's confusing, I know. Uh, const is a, is a language construct. It's not uh, enforceable in uh, memory or hardware or anywhere else. Uh, you c if two pointers alias and only one of them is constant, you can... <laughs> now, actually, uh, it's a small lie I am doing here for simplicity. Uh, Redist batch uh, is provably non-aliasing any of these. Actually, this uh, line uh, probably refers to hist size. I was hoping uh, not to go into this. Hist size could be aliasing. Uh, the, the loop boundary could be aliasing one of these. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter for your uh, question because... Uh, uh, decorating either one with const does not help. Uh, okay. Um, my initial hope was that LTO um, could provide some assistance here. It doesn't. N uh, negligible impact. Uh, even when the compiler or linker have visibility into fuller flows uh, of code, they do not produce better aliasing analysis. Uh, there is a canned solution in the form of restrict. This form with the underscores before and after is the GCC and the Clang form. Uh, if you use C, you use it uh, without uh, the underscores and it's an official keyword. This is useful if you're lucky and the aliasing you're trying to battle is uh, on an argument to a function. Uh, there are also uh, less commonly known attributes that um, presumably help fix states where um, uh, uh, aliasing is, uh, manifests as 
clobbered by call. Very often, uh, the compiler cannot prove that a function call somewhere does not change a global state. This is a way of informing the compiler that this function does not change global state. I've never seen it succeed. I've never seen it do anything useful. And uh, what I want to discuss more in depth is strict aliasing. This is something worth knowing. Uh, okay, this is a shameless cut and paste from a blog by Mike Acton. I think this provides very uh, concise explanation of what strict aliasing is. It is an assumption by the compiler that objects of different types never alias, never refer to the same location in memory. This is an optimization. It is on by default uh, for optimization levels O2 and beyond. Uh, there is an exception for char star, never mind that, and uh, you can disable it. It doesn't help in the example, uh, in the silly loop that I just uh, demonstrated, because in it, all variables in sight are ints. So let's change that. Let's make one of them not an int. How could we go about that? The first thing I tried was type def. It doesn't work. Type def, or the more modern version uh, using, does not generate a new type. It generates a new name for an existing type. Uh, the next thing I tried was to inherit int which might sound silly, uh, but, but it isn't. It, it would have generated definitely a new type, and this type uh, would have accepted for free all of its behaviors as I want, but you can't do that. Uh, I didn't know that. I learned that uh, only after trying. Sorry? I will s uh, soon do something uh, very similar, yes. Uh, it was actually considered for a, for a while, and it came with a whole baggage of other trouble, and uh, Bjarne Strossel uh, decided to drop it. What I do want to do is strong type defs. And this is a long and confusing discussion within the uh, C++ community. Uh, I need to say that... Uh, Typically, the discussion of strong type defs is a very different discussion. Um, people uh, who want ty strong type defs are usually motivated uh, by, by the will to prevent adding oranges and apples. Uh, if I have uh, uh, an int number of oranges and an int number of apples, I want the compiler to help me during overload resolution uh, uh, to, help, uh, to help me by complaining when I send uh, apples to a function that expects oranges. It doesn't have to be the, over, uh, the operator plus any function that expects oranges. Uh, if uh, if I was smart enough to mark the int variable as oranges type uh, or apples type, uh, would help me with type safety. This is not what I want. I want an int in disguise that is completely interchangeable with int. For all overload resolution purposes and for all behaviors except alias analysis. I want when the alias analyzer comes into play, I want it to be able to see that these two types are distinct and therefore cannot alias, and optimizations are legal. So uh, there is no strong type def in C++ out of the box. There are many variants uh, online. Uh, the one that I started from came from a very old uh, boost library called uh, boost serialization. This is very old. This is a... Uh, this is pre uh, C++ 11. Uh, I, I won't go over this code. Um, it does come close, but it doesn't do 
exactly what I want. Note the explicit here. I want this casting constructor at least to be implicit. Uh, there's also uh, no um, moving constructor here. It's, it's not complete work. So after some completion, I have my own cost, custom uh, strong type def. And here's how this loop looks after applying it. Somewhere uh, above this loop, the variables uh, are declared. There's underscore tile hist, which is an auto buffer, whatever that is, of int. And there's an int star tile hist, which is a pointer to its data. If we change that from int to the int in disguise t hist dot, Sorry. All these uh, aliasing complaints are resolved. Um, and it might be worthwhile at least once to go over uh, the disassembly and compare it and uh, really see that a load instruction, a move from a memory address into a register, is eliminated. After, this, after we jump through these hoops, the compiler is indeed able um, to, to let itself, to trust us and say uh, this variable does not change throughout the loop iterations. Um, okay, I, I will skip this. Uh, sure. Um, I think there's a good chance it would. If you, if you would have used std for each, the short answer is uh, I, I don't know. It's a good idea and it's worth checking. I don't know. I'm, if I had to guess, I, I have reason to believe it wouldn't. But I don't know. It's certainly worth checking. OK, um, I will go over this uh, more briefly. Um, a third example of optimization failure that I see, um, that I often see uh, in these reports, is loop hoisting. Here's another loop from somewhere deep in the bowels of uh, OpenCV. And I get this report, failed to move load with loop invariant address because the loop may invalidate its value. To cut a long story short, this complaint is about the boundaries end here. The same complaint, uh, this is somewhere inside this loop body, and the same complaint applies to L2 gradient. Uh, these two are loaded on every loop iteration. Uh, now let me tell you that these two are members of the function uh, of which this is a method of. Um, sorry? Maybe copy them out. If they are persistent, copy them, copy them outside the code and use them. Excellent idea. I will, I will do exactly this in a second. Uh, before I do that, let, let, let me... Uh, Skip to the bottom line of the analysis here. Uh, what happens inside, uh, elsewhere inside this loop body is that a pointer of the same type as this is written to. And the compiler feels obliged to accommodate the uh, obscene scenario in which uh, somewhere during this loop, I'm overwriting the this, the pointer to the instance object that I'm working on thereby invalidating the addresses of all my members. And I need to reload them from memory. Uh, you will not believe how often these things happen. Sorry, you say this? Yes. That's right, constant. that's right. I cannot write directly to this, but I can write to other pointers of the same type. And it is valid C++ uh, to have this different pointer of the same type, alias this. The compiler must take this uh, 
uh, possibility into account. What is the point of this, uh, you know, of this uh, error? Failed to move the lower three loops. What is the... This is essentially an uh, aliasing error on steroids. This means uh, not only do I reload this uh, from memory once, where I might have otherwise used an existing value in a register, I'm doing this on every loop iteration. This error is uh, um, generated by a different com uh, optimization pass. It is generated by a pass called LICM. That's loop invariant code motion. That's an optimization pass that tries to do exactly these things. Host const or uh, loop body invariant variables out of the loop. It failed. And as uh, Ari, I think, uh, uh, Avi, sorry, suggested, let's try to do this ourselves. If I do, these LICM complaints are resolved. Uh, um, this is not good C++ code. <laughs> uh, um, it's actually kind of embarrassing to advocate for such a code in a C++ conference. Uh, I, I know you could uh, select much more colorful adjectives. If uh, Linus Torvalds would hear, he would call this uh, a fucking brain-dead abomination <laughs> code. Uh, I... I um, uh, non idiom uh, pragmatic let's call this is very very pragmatic c++ code okay don't go doing these things just for the heck of it do these things in code you really really care about performance i really hope that uh, we'd live to see the day where compilers grow sophisticated enough so that we don't have to but this is not the case now uh, we typically uh, grossly overestimate the sophistication of compilers. Uh, my experience is that they fail miserably exactly at this dark corner of uh, alias analysis. Um, okay. Um, no, I will not discuss this. Uh, yes. I received a, a present last night from uh, Gal Falcon, a team leader in Istra and a C++ developer extraordinaire, who uh, told me that some time ago, someone asked Matt Godbolt, uh, hey man, why don't you add the, um, these cool optimization reports to Compiler Explorer? And that is how I learned uh, that this was in fact done. Uh, just a second. Can you see this? Yeah. Uh, let's go back. Uh, if I add optimization output here, uh, I get the source, not with inline annotations, but with uh, remarks on the side. And when I hover uh, above it, I get uh, these optimization reports. Um, uh, let me just give two comments. First, these are the full original opt viewer reports. This comes with a lot of extra baggage that typically does not interest you. Uh, also, um, this doesn't uh, expand headers. If I do uh, some C out, um, the, then, uh, oh, I don't have to. But if I just include something, you see that, uh, that all the optimization reports uh, relevant to this header are folded inside. This is, uh, this is not what you want for real life code. Typically, most of the interesting stuff 
most of the stuff, I mean, the optimization remarks with high impact are relevant to um, uh, headers. So this is a very nice way to uh, interactively experiment with the impact uh, on uh, optimizations without inspecting this assembly, which is completely unfeasible. Uh, but it's not a replacement for uh, running the naked scripts on your real life code. Um, Okay, um, two years later, GCC tried to catch up. As a matter of fact, today GCC has identical um, F save optimization record compiler switch, and it even has GCC opt viewer, not identical but similar uh, Python scripts which produce HTMLs. Uh, uh, the raw data is different. They don't use YAML files, they use JSON files, which is in fact a much better choice. Uh, processing JSONs in uh, Python is at least an order of magnitude faster. Um, I get the impression from admittedly very briefly playing around with the GCC version that uh, much fewer parts of the optimization pipeline in GCC report uh, these optimization comments, I get a lot less data. And this uh, work has been essentially dead since, uh, since 2018. So I think um, as of today, I would trust the optimization reports from Clang more. I hope to see this changed soon. Uh, I was asked, um, assuming this work is limited to Clang, can you benefit from it uh, if you're using different compilers? I don't know, uh, but if I have to guess, my guess is yes. Certainly for the easy cases like inlining report, if one compiler cannot see the definition of a function and therefore cannot uh, consider inlining it, certainly all compilers can see it. But even for the more delicate cases of alias analysis, um, I have reasons to believe that all compilers suck badly at alias analysis and Clang has the extra ability to shed light, to point us at the right direction. There is a good chance that uh, problems that you solve using Clang tools, assuming you're able to build your code on Clang, would help performance on other compilers as well. Testing them would be uh, orders of magnitude uh, less pleasant, uh, but at least profiling should show some difference. Okay, um, stuff I hope to do next uh, is improve the filtering ability of uh, optimization uh, remarks. Um, Clang is actually able to output these optimization reports in a binary format. And uh, I wish to, uh, currently the Python scripts uh, are not smart enough to consume it. I hope to make them able to do so. Uh, this is one of the ways in which I hope to make these scripts um, more pleasant to work with. They're still heavy. Uh, I want to integrate GCC viewer with it. Um, I, I, uh, one of the things I hope to do uh, to turn this in from a toy into a, a work tool is to uh, form some sort of comments 
saying, uh, hey, dear opt viewer, uh, move along. There's nothing to see in this line. Don't uh, confuse me with comments about it. Or at least this particular comment in this particular line can, uh, should be disabled. Uh, there's other stuff going around. Um, yes, and I do want to mention something about this. Uh, I'm growing um, increasingly convinced that um, aliasing reports that, I, that I'm now able to see are mistakes made by the compiler. Uh, this is not as far-fetched as it might seem because th these failures are, they're sort of like victimless crimes. They have uh, no symptoms. Uh, the generated code is completely valid. It is still optimized, so typically you don't see any uh, uh, performance bottlenecks. Uh, the compiler isn't uh, required to emit any diagnostics reports or warnings or whatever. So there is a good chance that no one actually saw uh, these alias analysis failures. And uh, we can help improve the compiler but l by looking at these reports and uh, starting a dialogue with LLVM developers about them. Sorry? Uh, go ahead. OK. Uh, there's lots of help needed if you find this interesting. Uh, please come join the party. Um, um, I actually put four um, entry-level issues at the issues section at the uh, GitHub repo. Um, some extra command line switches that uh, uh, can help improve the work and such. You can also talk to me directly. You can also ask me anything here or uh, in by mail or by Twitter or uh, otherwise. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> that was actually pretty accurate on time. If there are questions, I would love to answer. Uh, yeah? Uh, so ah, OK. So if uh, somebody uh, heard my lecture yesterday, this is a very good addition an additional tool to analyze the, uh, the the obfuscations that I spoke about yesterday. Because yesterday I ha said how we can use LLVM to obfuscate your C++ code. And uh, this tool can help you analyze these obfuscations and understand how good your obfuscation really worked. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. But you'd, you'd have to shout. Just a second, please. Just a second. I, I can't hear you. You have to shout. That's right. Uh, if I understand you correctly, that's actually one of the enhancements that uh, I left as an open issue. Uh, currently, um, the usage accept either a list of YAML files or a single directory which the implementation uh, scans through. And uh, it, yes, it generates a single index page for the entire contents of this directory. Uh, one of the ways in which we can make um, analysis more uh, separable is by generating such an index for every subfolder of uh, the parent folder containing all YAML files. Uh, and it's not done yet. Yes, it's a, a, you're very welcome to join and uh, implement this. This is, this is not very hard. It just wasn't done yet. Yeah. Uh, did you guys test it on your like production product and did you get like a significant benefit from it? Because it seems like it's a lot of work to allow uh, to apply these uh, optimizations to a large code base. 
Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, first, I work in algo trading, and I care about microseconds, sometimes nano. And for me personally, the bar to meet to justify this effort is much lower. Uh, now, secondly, um, I did skip the part about uh, measuring the results in OpenCV, uh, not the results of the random uh, optimizations uh, I showed you. I tried to do a more impactful one, and I did run uh, performance benchmarks on OpenCV before and after. Um, I can tell you briefly. Uh, Uh, probably the main type that OpenCV uses is called MAT, and uh, probably the main member of MAT is called DATA. And I tried to apply similar trickery uh, to prevent uh, alias, aliasing on every occurrence of data. Uh, never mind that now. Uh, I just uh, hid it bin behind a, a designated type. Uh, I actually saw results that are too good to be true. Uh, it's hard to see here, but um, a, lo a lot of the performance tests on OpenCV just present uh, noise. Some are a bit slower, some are a bit uh, faster. But there are some... Um, uh, some clusters of tests that show significant speedups. I mean, double digit percent. I mean, like 20, 30 percent speedups from this change. Um, and I don't trust that yet. Um, I think there's still a chance that I made a mistake here. And, you know, Dan Ariely just uh, finished his career. Uh, doing similar mistakes, I don't want to commit to measurable results on this scale yet. Um, but, but I think they are there. I think if you uh, pinpoint the right bottleneck uh, to squeeze this extra performance out of, you would see, you should see measurable results. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if it's the case with the exponent of the mark that the output with the what? The doctor actually gets the exports from from the plant, right? But then it's from the LLVM. Could someone repeat that? The doctor works on the output of LLVM. Yes. No. No, so it's on the actual um, machine, machine code? The LLVM backend emits text uh, remarks that the opt viewer analyzes into HTML annotations. I mean, the opt viewer does not work on IR, it works on text files. Uh, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, these particular remarks, optimization remarks that I shown, uh, no, they are not architecture specifics. Uh, but these were three examples out of a few dozens that I came across. Some of them might be. I, I don't know. Certainly, so, certainly. I wonder if this tool can help, you know, analyze those bottlenecks. That's a great question, and actually I don't know. I, I haven't uh, analyzed it in a...
cross-platform scenario. Sure. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's true. Uh, it needs to be said that there are um, between 120 and 170 uh, optimization passes in the LLVM. Uh, depends on which pass manager you use, and most of them do not emit this info. Um, the three optimization uh, remark types that I demonstrated are the most common in the three or four code bases that I tested, uh, and they are front-end remarks. But these are not the only ones. I, I, I don't dare say anything in general about all remarks emitted. Some of them might be architecture specific. Thank you very much. Let's go with it.